Stanford University. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. And um, in my presentation, I would like to talk about um, financing the next stage of the global green energy, energy transformation. That's a rather ambitious uh, title, I admit. I will um, well um, spend most of the time uh, to show you um, the problem and leave it to you to figure out the solutions during the coming uh, years of your academic work and work in um, uh, business. Uh, let me briefly introduce KFW, uh, then um, uh, show you where Germany stands in promoting renewable energy. I believe it's at a turning point. Um, I want to talk next about uh, global renewable energy deployment, um, which is, in my view, consolidation in, in progress. Um, uh, I want to talk about status and challenges of international climate finance, and then I I want to uh, well um, come to the uh, actual subject of my my presentation towards a new phase of renewable energy uh, promotion and close with an outlook. Briefly about KFW, um, it is the state-owned bank uh, with a um, um, uh, strong uh, promotional mandate to work with um, SMEs uh, to uh, find provide finance for energy climate. Um, energy efficiency, climate uh, protection in the building sector. Um, it was fi founded in 1948 to implement the Marshall Plan and has now roughly 5,000 employees. And we provide, we finance investment in Germany and um, Europe. We provide international project and export finance and provide support for developing countries under the um, umbrella of uh, development assistance. Um, in 2011, we had uh, roughly uh, uh, 100 billion uh, US dollars disbursements, um, and about one third of that was uh, for renewable energy and energy efficiency, which makes us the uh, world number one financier um, of renewable energy and energy efficiency uh, projects. Um, <clears throat> the basic business model of KFW as a, a strong uh, state, a promotional uh, state bank, is uh, to um, uh, access capital markets uh, uh, um, uh, using the AAA rating um, based on the uh, state uh, guarantee um, and uh, pass on um, concessional loans um, based on these uh, favorable refinancing conditions to a, a customer's bank and then um, uh, 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 have that customer's bank provide uh, a loan, uh, concessional loan products uh, to the end customer that could be um, uh, modernization loans in, uh, um, to uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, green lo loans to private households or student loans. Um, we are covering, are covering quite a range of different um, activities in the field of green finance, uh, offshore, onshore wind parks, photovoltaics, uh, concentrated solar power, uh, modernization of, of uh, buildings, industrial energy efficiency, but also uh, water supply, geothermal energy, um, and forestry protection on a fairly large scale. We actually have a protection portfolio of twice the size of Germany um, around the world. Um, we work um, in a network of um, other development banks. Um, um, so we have um, set up a, a group called the International Development Finance Club, in which you see some, you'll find some prominent uh, development banks from um, other countries like BNDS from Brazil, Development Bank of South Africa or China Development Bank, but also uh, similar uh, entities like KFW from France, AFD, JICA from Japan. Um, the combined asset of these uh, banks is uh, roughly two trillion uh, US dollars, uh, which is about four times as much as the World Bank Group. New commitments added up to about uh, 400 billion US dollars. Um, key activities of this uh, club of uh, institutions focused on uh, green finance activities. There was a green finance mapping, um, exchange on good practices um, in private sector mobilization and support of the implementation of the Green Climate Fund. 
um, just to show you basically what we are, uh, the role these development banks play internationally in green finance, I'll show you some results from our green finance map mapping. This view graph here on the top shows you um, that uh, IDFC members provided a total of 90 billion US dollars in green, in green finance in uh, 2011. Um, uh, 30 billion were from northern countries in uh, domestic uh, industrialized countries, for the home market in domestic, uh, in industrialized countries. Um, southern banks provided um, 45 billion US dollars um, uh, for their domestic market to finance uh, energy efficiency and renewable energies. And then there was this flow of about 15 billion US dollars from the north to the south. The share of green finance uh, within this group of institutions varies from uh, more than 50% to only a few percent, um, which uh, is mainly due to the fact of different mandates, but also different uh, promotional frameworks in each of uh, the institution's um, uh, jurisdiction. Um, so far, um, uh, green energy mitigation projects dominate the portfolios, the green finance portfolio of these institutions with adaptation, uh, only 10% of the whole uh, um, green finance portfolio. Let me um, now uh, talk a bit about um, re renewable energy promotion in Germany, which is at a, at a turning point. I mean, we had the uh, uh, parliamentary decision on the uh, phase out of nuclear energy last year and already a uh, um, history of about 10 years of fairly aggressive uh, promotion of renewable energies based on a um, dynamic feed-in law and a, a very consistent uh, removal of uh, implementation barriers um, in different, uh, at different stages of the planning process. Um, so what you see in this view graph is the red line shows you the uh, growth of renewable energy production in Germany in terms of gigawatt peak until 2010. And you see that while we started back in the 1990s with mainly hydropower as the main source, uh, that has shifted completely. I mean, hydropower has remained basically unchanged, but the share has gone down as uh, total renewable energy generation has gone up with wind energy and uh, solar now being uh, the dominant uh, contributions to the renewable energy um, uh, generation in Germany with um, biomass and, and geothermal um, adding uh, to this uh, portfolio of generation. Um, <clears throat> to show you the impact of this and how far this uh, contribution of renewable energy has gone already, let me show you uh, uh, two view graphs from um, uh, two, um, I believe, rather typical months uh, in, of the German uh, energy generation mix. It shows you for each, I mean, the peaks are basically the, the um, daily uh, peak load uh, uh, situations um, during daytime and going down to this uh, middle level, ah, there's a pointer, um, uh, to this uh, level here during night times. The weekends are, uh, of course, have a lower energy demand uh, compared to the week. And what you see, this is a picture from June uh, that, I mean, uh, solar energy is contributing quite heavily on sunny days uh, to the peak load um, in Germany. Um, if wind um, is available, which is the uh, the green one, uh, it also uh, co uh, uh, contributes quite heavily to the, to the peak load and of course to um, partly to, to base load uh, during night, night times. But of course, as you will see in the next view graph, if there is less wind and uh, less um, uh, solar, like on this, uh, like in February, you see that um, most of the peak load um, is generated from, uh, based on natural gas with renewable energies only contributing fairly small amounts. I mean, this shows you, I mean, in Germany, I mean, as you know, I mean, the, um, may know, I mean, the, the sunny, uh, the sun sometimes <laughs> shines uh, and off, quite frequently it's also a strong overcast. So it's not very predictable. Wind is also quite variable. So it is, uh, these are not the most favorable um, conditions for a massive deployment of solar and wind energy, but still this makes a, a quite a major contribution now, but also imposes quite heavy challenges to ensure that there is a, a stable energy supply that blackouts can be avoided. And you need uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, reserve capacity 
uh, f um, for for the uh, to compensate for the fluctuation effects um, um, for wind and and um, solar. Um, this is um, kind of a um, spread showing again the the contribution from solar for a typical day. Wind, I mean, it can vary a lot, and it also shows you that on the total energy balance for Germany, you get into situations where we have to export uh, this kind of peak production from solar or that you end up in situations during night times or uh, when there is low uh, uh, irradiation or wind uh, where we have to uh, import energy from surrounding countries. So this is uh, quite, quite a challenge uh, to uh, maintain a, a stable uh, electricity supply and shows that uh, technically, I mean, this is uh, coming to um, certain uh, technical limits where you need um, additional measures uh, to store, store uh, fluctuating uh, energy uh, from wind and solar. Um, so let me briefly show you uh, kind of the uh, key uh, elements of this energy transition taking place in Germany. Um, there is an objective to increase the share of renewable energies in gross final energy consumption up to 60% uh, by 2050. It's now at 11%. And to increase the share of renewables in gr gross electricity consumption uh, to up to 80%, which is now at 17%. Um, so far, the challenges um, are, so far, we have had a massive, largely uncoordinated expansion of solar and wind energy generation, um, delays of, for offshore wind, uh, wind uh, parks, and um, uh, we need additional fossil power plants for reserve capacity, but there is li little economic incentive uh, for uh, private investors to invest into this. The EU emission trading system so far, because of low prices, provides weak incentives. Uh, <coughs> we need to ensure an early participation of affected citizens and municipalities to uh, keep up this uh, um, um, speed and ensure that uh, acceptance uh, in the, uh, in the um, population uh, is maintained. So there is a strong need for, to expand power grids and storage capacity to get beyond this situation where we are now, where the grid uh, is really at, at, its, at its limit. Um, and uh, that requires uh, quite heavy uh, financial efforts um, and uh, um, some uh, major um, uh, yeah, technology, technological advances uh, to uh, b uh, provide this uh, grid stability um, on, at reasonably low costs. Um, until 2030, we expect investment, uh, in additional investments of up to 90 billion euros. And of course, um, not to be uh, forgotten uh, as part of such an energy transformation process is uh, to um, aggressively work uh, on the improvement of energy efficiency um, uh, using the uh, appropriate instruments and uh, again resulting in an, a need for additional investment. Um, to, conc to summarize this uh, section, the promotion of renewable energy in Germany is part of an international success story because, I mean, uh, costs have gone down significantly and renewable energies have become available as an almost uh, commercial option across the world. I think that massive scale up in Germany has been part of that uh, success story. The main instrument has been a dynamic feed-in law plus a comprehensive uh, removal of barriers. Um, it has been an incentive-driven bottom-up process um, economic efficiency and sustainability of the system had second priority to effectiveness. Um, uh, political acceptance to businesses and voters uh, is a critical issue now. It is coming to its limits. Uh, and we are now in a process of a comprehensive overhaul, uh, overhaul um, because of uh, ra raising electricity costs and, and um, threats to grid st stability. Uh, let me now uh, move towards um, the global deployment of renewable energy. Um, this, is, uh, this and the following view graphs, are, view graphs are borrowed from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. This shows you that over the last um, a cup, a couple of years, um, uh, clean energy investment has grown um, significantly and is, uh, still has not exceeded fossil fuel investment. Um, in the electricity sector, but has grown uh, impressively. 
at the same time, um, there have been significant price digressions for wind and solar energy. The um, deployment and or the development, the growth of uh, renewable energy deployment in different world regions has been uh, quite uh, different. I mean, in Asia, we see a fairly constant uh, rise of, of renewable energy deployment, largely driven by China uh, plus India. Um, North America, um, kind of a rise, a dip, and then the rise, and potentially with the tax, uh, end of the tax uh, uh, exemption scheme, this is likely to drop again. And Europe with a, a strong rise and then a slow uh, decline of energy deployment and uh, still fairly limited uh, deployment of uh, renewable energy in South America and uh, Africa. Um, this has been, uh, is this looked to a policymaker, this uh, looked like a, a self sustained um, a growth story um, and only with a small dip 2008 um, from as a result of the financial crisis with the respective uncertainty. But what you can see here now is that um, things are turning now. And you could also say, well, this is just another uh, kind of um, jitter of the curve. But I personally believe that this is a, um, a, a fairly robust trend of, of decline unless uh, po international policy measures are ta being taken. Uh, you can see this is by region. Um, so um, you can see that uh, a new deployment uh, by quarter here um, it has gone down in Europe. Um, it's still, no, it's going down also in North America and Asia has been fo fairly robust. Um, and if you look at different technologies, you can see that um, wind at the bottom has uh, gone down. Solar, which is the majority, in fact, of this new investment, uh, has remained fairly stable. Biofuels had a strong expansion in the uh, 2005 to 2008 years, mainly in North America, and it uh, has declined uh, quite significantly. Um, and um, yeah, other uh, renewable energies uh, currently do not play such a large role. Um, so this is why is this? Uh, do I believe that this bending down of the curve is a, um, a fairly robust trend? Um, uh, uh, that is uh, because of um, th the fact that uh, green energy deployment is driven actually by a few key in, by developments in a few uh, key countries. So that's the U.S., that's uh, China, that's India, that's Germany, Spain, and you may want to add the U.K. But that's it's basically a handful of countries with their respective promotional schemes. Which, deter which drive the dynamics of this renewable energy market. And in most of these countries, for um, different reasons, uh, there is a revision um, of the uh, re renewable energy promotional system. So um, to conclude, to summarize this section, um, we have, over the last decade, we have seen a very impressive policy-driven market growth uh, for new renewables. There have been very substantial cost digressions, um, mainly because of incremental technology change and econo economies of scale. We are now below grid parity for solar and uh, at commercial competitiveness for wind in many uh, regions and countries, which is really a breakthrough and uh, I think uh, offers quite some chances for the use of these technologies in developing countries, uh, as well, of course, in industrialized countries. Um, the, in my view, the expansion of renewable energy promotion is, or the expansion of renewable energy is slowing down in the core countries. Uh, equity investors are largely bearish about the sector. I skipped this uh, slide showing the development of the renewable energy end index. And um, I believe that um, uh, we are now entering a phase of a regionally broader dissemination of renewable energy, but it's certainly not a, a given as uh, something that will happen by its own on, a, on the comparable level to what we have seen um, uh, driven by uh, strong national policies in the five to, to seven countries which I mentioned. Uh, let me now uh, enter the field of the status and challenges of international climate um, uh, change finance. 
as you all may know that um, uh, to reach a two degree or three degree uh, stabilization target of the world climate, a massive um, uh, uh, change is uh, required from the um, uh, current growth model um, which links GDP growth to um, uh, CO2 emissions. So we need to uh, move away from this reference trajectory to a low carbon development pathway. Uh, this is connected to significant uh, additional investment needs. I mean, there are uh, plenty of, of models around, and I mean, these, these are the IEA data, which seem reasonable. Uh, this shows you the uh, need for additional annual investment on low carbon technologies across different regions. And without going into any details, it shows you that um, in 2020 and then uh, uh, rising uh, over the uh, following 15 years, we arrive at very substantial additional investment needs um, across the different regions of the world uh, to meet uh, um, uh, the requirements of a low carbon development pathway. So we are talking about additional investments of about uh, 1 trillion US dollars by 2030, which is a doubling um, of um, the uh, additional investment uh, for, this, for the energy sector um, in a, a reference uh, development scenario. Uh, IEA also estimates um, the uh, need for, uh, um, to subsidize um, re renewable energies because of their incremental costs. Um, uh, and I mean, of course, these costs are these subsidy uh, needs are lower than the uh, in, than the investment uh, needs, but they are still in a very s substantial uh, range of uh, above uh, 100 billion US dollars per year globally, um, and yeah, largely um, I mean about 100 billion needed in uh, Europe plus US and a significant amount as well in, in China, India, and uh, the rest of the world. This can, of course, be delivered through different uh, means, through tax um, credits, through feed-in laws, um, um, uh, and, and, and other uh, mechanisms, output-based uh, approaches uh, based on saved uh, amounts of CO2. Um, okay, I'll skip this one, this spaghetti graph on the uh, landscape of climate finance. Um, let me briefly address um, the state of discussions on the green UN Green Climate Fund, um, uh, to which people connect fairly high hopes. Um, it was agreed at the 16th uh, Conference of the Parties in Cancun in December uh, 2010. Uh, the uh, basic um, the govern government uh, instrument, the uh, founding document, was agreed uh, last year in Durban. And uh, the interim secretariat has started its work now in Bonn. And uh, uh, the permanent uh, seat will be decided uh, in Doha uh, later this year. Um, the board with balanced representation, 12 uh, uh, people from developing countries and industrialized countries, has started its work uh, in the second half of this year. You can see from the um, uh, time scales, as this is a politically driven process which uh, requires uh, quite a bit of time. We'll see pledging, uh, first pledging round uh, in next, next year. The target volume will be uh, optimistic. The estimate for the target vo volume will be 10 billion US dollars for the first period of a few years. That is not, I mean, it's a huge amount of money, but uh, it is um, um, obviously much less than what is uh, needed in terms of additional investment or um, uh, to cover the additional costs, the subsidy need for renewable energies. Its business model, the uh, instruments and access modalities uh, will be inspired by what we know from the Global Environment Facility, from the Climate Investment Funds and the Adaptation Fund. Um, but it is not decided yet. The private sector facility is a, a private sector facility is foreseen, but its focus, instruments, and access uh, um, modalities are unclear. We will probably see windows for all major themes of, of climate finance, adaptation, forest protection, and technology-based mitigation based on renewable energies and energy efficiency. Uh, the resource allocation framework for countries and, and sectors is uh, not decided yet. 
um, and neither um, have been decisions made on the monitoring and evaluation of this instrument. There will be direct and international access modalities, but is, this is going to be uh, um, still uh, quite some way until the GCF becomes operational and, and until it can uh, yeah, fill uh, a major ro role in this uh, challenge to um, finance renewable energy. Uh, to, con to summarize this section, um, uh, I mean, the private sector that was mainly visible in this spaghetti view graph, which I skipped, is the main investor for international renewable energy projects. There is a central role for development banks in several key markets and many developing countries. We currently have a fragmented delivery of international support, um, limited room for more of the same due to budgetary constraints. Uh, I th so we have to focus on an, uh, to, on an improvement of coordination and efficiency. There is little pro progress on the finance uh, discussions in the UN climate negotiations. There are high hopes but limited progress and funding for the UN uh, Climate F Fund. So there is, um, I believe, uh, scope and a need for um, an initiative to promote renewable energies by a limited group of countries. I'll now come to some core elements of how this uh, could potentially be done. Um, I believe that, I mean, renewable energies are, of course, not a new thing uh, created in this uh, millennium. I mean, we, mankind has worked a long time with wood, wind and water and made use of that. Then we have, during the 20th century, we have seen a massive expansion of hydroelectricity. And now we are in a phase of an expansion of new renewables. And I'm seeing basically these three sub, sub phases. Um, we have started with a demonstration and exploratory, exploratory in, in incentive schemes. Uh, then, I mean, what I think is now coming to, potentially coming to an end, is the scaling up of deployment to through ad hoc national promotional schemes. And I think. Uh, we are moving into a phase of uh, a broader regional dissemination um, with focused and efficiently designed support uh, measures. Um, in the uh, climate discussions, there is this expectation that, um, I mean, if there is too little public uh, finance, you just need to uh, find a smart way to mobilize the private sector. Um, but, of course, there are fairly um, important barriers or, uh, for the private sector also to embrace on uh, the use of renewable energies. In many cases, there are incremental investment needs, there are incremental costs and ad additional and unfamiliar risks, which prevent, frequently prevent the private sector from um, uh, embracing um, renewable energy uh, projects. Um, so generally, costs and risks do not disappear. Um, uh, there are mixed experiences with international um, uh, public-private partnership approaches over the last decade, so it cannot be s easily um, taken and, and scaled up. Um, new international instruments are not, are not necessarily attractive uh, to the private sector, so I think there is a good reason to strengthen existing structures. Uh, but, of course, we, we can be optimistic because cost digressions in the renewable uh, sector continue and familiarity with specific risks uh, increases. Let's briefly have a look at um, uh, country risks, which are a key element uh, which uh, can prevent private sector investors from uh, investing um, in renewable energy projects in emerging countries and developing countries. This shows you the um, Standard & Poor's rating of uh, sovereign bonds of countries, which you can use as a proxy for the country risks. Uh, so what you, I mean, anything below triple B would be, uh, I mean, B, triple B and above would be investment grade. And what you see is that the major economies, uh, which are also uh, uh, responsible for the majority of greenhouse gas emissions, are actually uh, rated uh, in the investment grade category. So. US, Canada, most of the OECD countries, China, Brazil, South Africa. Um, so the, the good story here is that, the good part of the story is that uh, roughly 80% of global greenhouse gas emissions are located in investment grade countries uh, with uh, risk premium of less than 300 basis points, which uh, tells us that um, uh, country risks uh, for renewable energy uh, projects uh, do not have a, 
um, an excessive price which uh, could be compensated quite easily um, by risk mitigation instruments which, which are available commercially or from the World Bank through its MIGA instrument, for example. Um, yeah, with an eye on time, let me skip this one. Um, so um, what are basically potential building blocks um, to um, design a global system um, uh, that can uh, enhance the deployment of renewable energies on a global stage and uh, increase the uh, uh, regional coverage. First of all, I mean, clearly without any policy actions, we will still see further price digressions as there uh, will be overcapacity in the wind and solar market in coming years, which will help to facilitate the commercial expansion into new uh, regional markets. Uh, something that would clearly be extremely helpful is the good old reduction of fossil fuel subsidies, which uh, of course um, is uh, um, decreasing the competitiveness of renewable energies uh, if there are um, significant fossil fuel subsidies. Then of course there continues to be a need for capacity development and policy advice on national frameworks. I mean there is still good policy design is a challenge as you can also see from my own country in Germany where um, I mean a lot of goodwill and, and enthusiasm was put into the design of policies, uh, but we did not end up at a very efficient uh, uh, system to promote renewable energies. Then, of course, there is a lot of scope for soft loans from international finance institutions and national development banks. Uh, there could be subsidized credit guarantees, mega type for specific technologies and countries. And, of course, uh, there is scope for global performance-based support like we know it from the CDM based on tons of CO2, re CO2 reductions delivered, uh, feed-in tariffs uh, uh, co-financed uh, through international uh, partners or auctioning schemes for generation, generation capacity from certain technologies and there uh, are certainly more. Uh, to conclude this uh, final section of my presentation, there is uh, certainly no silver bullet at hand um, I mean, the good news is that the main mitigation potential from renewables and energy efficiency is located in investment-grade countries. Um, but of course, the issue of universal energy access in Africa requires a completely different set of, of instruments. I mean, that is uh, kind of simple, available de-risking instruments will not do the, uh, the trick in sub-Sahara Africa. They are simply, these countries are simply uh, off-limit for most commercial investors. Um, I think um, uh, there is uh, scope to strengthen existing instruments in a complementary fashion to new structures like the GCF. I think we need a mix of international measures available um, and uh, uh, to, in order to support um, a broad international expansion of renewable energy. There is, I think, uh, a challenge of coordination and integration of output-based approaches, risk mitigation instruments, soft loans and technical assistance. I mean, there is now a wild diversity of interventions by different donors and different countries, uh, which is again leaving, uh, leading to suboptimal and inefficient solutions. And I think uh, with the limited uh, uh, public resources available, we need to move beyond this. To conclude my presentation, um, I mean, we are looking back uh, to a huge success story um, on the one hand. I mean, the expansion of renewable energy in key markets over less than one decade, I think, is a great success. But um, it is costly and it is slowing. Um, so if we are serious about meeting uh, climate targets, uh, we may have to uh, increase international efforts. Um, so there is clearly need for further um, innovation, financial innovation uh, to foster um, uh, the expansion of renewable energy, but we should not wait for them as, I mean, many instruments have been tested um, and, um, I mean, uh, so there is a range of products available. So we should uh, probably um, start with strengthening proven modalities of private-public cooperation and risk mitigation. Uh, in my view, development banks, international finance institutions, and potentially also the export crediting agencies 
um, uh, can have a strong role in this international effort to um, promote renewable energies because of their implementation, know-how, access to capital markets and their familiarity to investors. So I think we need to establish an attractive and politically acceptable international framework for coordinated activities by countries and that is likely to be um, at least in parallel to the UNFCCC process. And to conclude, um, and I think it's quite appropriate to conclude with this point um, in this uh, region of the world and of the United States, uh, I, I mean, to my view, so far technological innovation has been largely incremental. Um, and uh, we have not seen any breakthrough um, technologies or breakthrough innovations uh, hit the market in, the, in this field yet. And of course, it, uh, it's, it's a quite an interesting discussion or a question uh, whether we should, uh, can expect any uh, to contribute to, this, uh, to the solution of this uh, problem over the coming, uh, say, five years. Thank you very much for your attention. issue of Photon Magazine, they say that the, the stu studies by the German government uh, by 2035 can do 100% renewable energy, uh, creating uh, at least 20% into the base load, uh, converting it into, uh, uh, I, I believe it's methane and, and hydrogen uh, as as the base load, so, so that ostensibly 100% of it could all come from, from uh, renewables. Do you know anything about, about this and how you finance it? I mean, you see uh, quite a number of studies which look at the te technical possibilities to move towards uh, um, basically a, a zero carbon electricity uh, system. Uh, was fairly in, was in a fairly short uh, time frame and I mean clearly the options are there but um, I mean if a country pursues this in, in isolation I mean it, it uh, um, uh, yeah uh, the competi competitiveness of its industries uh, is likely to deteriorate uh, in comparison to uh, other countries so I mean there have been I mean uh, I mean, there are some studies, but I mean, costs get, get uh, using existing technologies uh, get fairly substantial, leading to uh, very significant price increases of the electricity sector. So most of the studies basically focus on the technical viability of these ways. And I mean, there are plenty of ways of showing that this can be done at reasonable costs. But of course, political acceptance by taxpayers, consumers, and also Competitiveness, competitiveness issues need to be considered uh, as well um, if you make a decision about whether you really want to move forward uh, at that pace into this direction. Um, so I'm wondering as the amount of funds have uh, lessened over the last few years, if the investment profiles have changed at all from the development of commercial banks? Have you guys looked at different kinds of SMEs or projects or for different timelines on payoffs? Have you just become tighter or anything like that? Or how has what you're investing in changed with less money? Um, clearly, the, the I mean, if I got your question right, I mean, the financial crisis has had quite, quite an impact um, on the funding of renewable energies. I mean, it has, uh, I mean, there is a an increasing risk aversion. It has been become much more difficult to obtain long-term finance from commercial banks. Uh, the prospect also for the coming years um, is, um, well, a, a difficult one as uh, with the implementation of the Bell uh, uh, 3 regulation. I mean, um, banks will become, uh, I mean, uh, less able to provide long-term finance and will uh, scale down their uh, portfolio of new loans. So this is something where you, if you just with the same promotional um, uh, framework, you need to ensure that um, alternative sources of finance become available. I mean, that could of course be 
um, public sector banks, development banks, but of course it is also the insurance sector which is um, uh, moving into this, this field. Projections are kind of increasing contributions from China necessarily like in the future to increase use of renewable energy. So, as a are they likely to do that, or be how could they be incentivized to do that without you know companies spending their development? I'm not sure whether I can. Are they likely ah, okay. to make those investments? Um, that's a very good question, but of course that uh, I mean even if you if you're not looking at a mitigation scenario, but just look at the energy need in these countries. I mean, you can have, of course, um, serious doubts whether the, these countries will be able to meet these uh, investment needs. I mean, that already applies to industrialized countries. I mean, there is a tendency, of course, to continue to work with outdated, uh, an outdated um, uh, generation um, uh, capacity, mix of generation capacity. Um, I mean, a country like Brazil is will have to make huge efforts to meet the um, investment, uh, to mobilize the investment needs uh, to, uh, for energy over the next uh, 20 years. So, I mean, they are um, yeah, uh, working quite hard to find ways um, uh, to, to make this uh, possible. I mean, at this point in time, I would still be least concerned about China, but of course, we don't know about uh, the, what the situation in China will be in five to 10 years from now. And that's, of course, only the kind of uh, business as usual um, expansion of the energy sector based on uh, fossil technology. But as I uh, mentioned, um, low carbon uh, development pathway will require about uh, uh, twice as much uh, investment um, for the energy sector because of the higher upfront investment need of most renewable energies, which is then uh, being paid back by uh, reduced or no fuel costs uh, during the operation time of the equipment. What effect do you think uh, having a carbon tax would have on spurring incentives and in spurring technology and in spurring investment? I mean, the, the obvious answer is, I mean, of course, it depends on the level uh, and, and predictability of, of the uh, uh, of this carbon tax? No, we don't. I mean, there is the emission trading uh, scheme, um, which has the a price on carbon for the electricity and the industrial sector. But uh, that uh, price is now fairly low. I mean, that is at about uh, 8 euros per ton of CO2, um, which does not send, uh, um, a, yeah, you would say a, a sufficient or a strong incentive to invest into low carbon um, uh, technologies. Currently, I mean, again, an example of um, potentially, I mean, effective but uh, sub suboptimal policy design in the EU, you see overlapping policies that you have strong targets on renewables, you have strong targets on energy efficiency, and you have uh, um, CO2 um, a cap on CO2 and the EU ETS, but they uh, overlap and, and partly counteract. So if you expand renewables um, and uh, reduce electricity consumption, um, then uh, the uh, more CO2 allowances become available uh, to in the EU emission trading system. So the, uh, the expansion of renewables and the um, uh, inc improve, improvement of uh, energy efficiency lowers the price of CO2 allowances in the system. And so that is something that if one uh, could reform or uh, this, um, you would aim to um, uh, combine it into uh, one system uh, where you don't have these, these overlaps and partly counteracting effects. Okay, two more questions. Uh, so for the $33 billion investment that you mentioned um, that KFW had in renewables last year, could you talk a little about the mix of financing products, for example, project finance and equity versus mm -hmm. funds like debt and how, whether there's a mapping between the type of financing that we use and the stage of um, development for the particular technology? Mm -hmm. I mean, this um, $33 billion 
um, in 2011 is largely driven by uh, uh, the German market. So it's, I think, 80% of that is uh, um, used in Germany. And um, because of the mix of instruments of KFW, this is largely concessional, mildly concessional, concessional loans. And we do not apply grants. And um, because of our mandate, uh, we don't make uh, f uh, equity investments in this sector. But of course, if you like the UK, is now setting up this uh, green investment bank um, and of course um, trying to, to learn from, from uh, our experience in Germany and in other countries and they will probably take a, a different approach on how they frame the promotional mandate uh, of the green investment bank and probably work more on the side of uh, taking equity positions. Um, but that's really depends on, on how the owner um, of the bank, which is the Federal Republic, um, uh, sets the priorities uh, for the choice of instruments. Okay, I have one last question in the back. Um, um, I was wondering what the timeline is for the operationalization of the Green Climate Fund. And also, um, I know this is a very complex question, but what do you think needs to happen um, like what participation or participants need to be involved in the formation of the private sector facility for it to be effective and yeah. maybe being a silver bullet that you're talking about. I mean, uh, clearly, um, because the uh, Green Climate Fund will have a, a critical role to play in the design of the um, international policy regime that will hopefully enter into force in, by 2020. It needs to show um, uh, its ability to deliver and also uh, needs to have a defined role in a uh, global uh, mitigation uh, framework um, over the next, I would say, uh, two years. I mean, obviously that will not uh, equal to uh, substantial disbursements as, I mean, it takes time to build a project uh, pipeline. But as I uh, indicated on my slide, I mean, the, uh, the Green Climate Fund will probably um, uh, build or even uh, integrate uh, elements of the uh, Global Environment Facility and of the Clean Technology Fund. So there may be a fairly rapid ability to disperse and to build on the project uh, pipelines of, of these fund structures. Um, uh, regarding the um, private sector facility, uh, I believe there. I mean, there are yeah different directions of development. Um, I mean, there are a lot of people from the financial sector, from industrialized countries, which really want to test uh, new financial instruments, advanced uh, modes of delivery of of climate finance, um, which would require also an access, direct access of private sector entities, uh, financial service entities uh, to the private sector facility. And on the other side, you have, I think, um, um, a, a preference uh, with at most developing country governments to um, not open up a kind of a separate access modality to the Green Climate Fund. There is a, a fear that in the end it will be just a recycling of funding from industrialized countries to uh, industrialized private sector entities and that it will bypass, uh, in fact, uh, developing countries. And I mean, there is uh, the hope by many countries that adaptation will be a, um, kind of the major focus of the uh, Green Climate Fund. And I mean, uh, adaptation is not very suitable uh, to finance, uh, to be financed through private sector um, activities. So I think in the end, it will be a fairly um, uh, conventional approach uh, working through the national governments. I, I personally don't think that we will end up in a situation where this private sector facility will be open to um, uh, companies and, and banks from industrialized countries. All right, very okay. good. Thank you once again. Good. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.